Welcome. I'm Cindy Edwards, board chair for the Jacksonville Onslow Chamber of Commerce. On behalf of the Chamber's Governmental Affairs Committee, I want to thank you for joining us for today's Forum Onslow. The Governmental Affairs Committee works with government agencies on issues that affect our business community. The committee monitors legislative issues that impact local businesses, promotes partnerships between business, government, military, and education sectors, and presents forums like this one to create awareness on topics that are important to our entire community. Thank you to each of the candidates for joining us today, and thank you to the City of Jacksonville for the use of these facilities and the City's media services. Our corporate sponsor is Duke Energy, who has partnered with the Chamber to support forums like this for many years. They believe a well-informed constituency makes informed decisions. I now invite Millie Chalk, Duke Energy District Manager for Government and Community Relations, and a member of our Chamber's Board of Directors to the podium. Thank you. Hello. And on behalf of Duke Energy, welcome to Forum Onslow. Duke Energy has a long history of partnering with the Jacksonville Onslow Chamber of Commerce in sponsoring this forum focused on candidates running for Onslow County Board of Education. Educating and inspiring our students to be the best is critical for all of us, as our students of today will one day be our future leaders. Being an informed voter is our responsibility, and of course, Voting is a right. I look forward to an informational session as our candidates outline the priorities for Onslow County Schools. Duke Energy has a proud tradition of leadership and engagement in our communities and is proud to sponsor Forum Onslow. Now, on to our candidates. All right. My name is Elliot Potter. I'll be your moderator uh, this afternoon. I've done this a few times, and I know a few of you I've seen before uh, up here in the spring when we had our form, uh, for our form onslow uh, for the primaries, and then we've got newcomers this time because we have the general election. Um, there are three seats open on the Board of Education in this election, and we have five candidates, uh, three Republicans, two Democrats. Uh, this is the first time we have had... Uh, partisan elections when we have people identified as either a Democrat or a Republican uh, in some time. Uh, that used to be the case, and then it wasn't the case, and now it's the case again. So, uh, so whatever the situation is, here we are. And uh, even though uh, for some people it's a very awkward time for politics, we're still uh, in the middle of, after all, uh, the aftermath of a major hurricane here. Uh, but uh, we appreciate that you folks did take your time and the people in the audience and the people that are looking at home, uh, watching at home or listening at home, uh, have taken their time uh, to, to participate in this. We do think it's very important. And we want to make it uh, an informative day, an enjoyable day. Uh, one of the things that I, we try, that I said this morning in, in, uh, when we had our uh, House session and our State Senate sessions, uh, we, we don't try to make these, the chamber has never had a goal of trying to make this to be some sort of gotcha moment. Uh, we try to just, we, it, this is all about information, and uh, we want you folks to shine. So uh, we're going to try to uh, follow a few rules here to do that. Uh, the format that we thought that we do uh, each year, the, of course, the people have a chance to submit questions. Some have already been submitted and worked into the program, and then I received a lot of cards today, and so we'll do as many as we can, but uh, we are a little bit limited on time, but because we're going to try to keep today's program to about an hour. You will have an opportunity to make a two-minute opening statement, and following that, we will do uh, round robin, and we will just keep the questions going, and we'll move down the panel in various orders. Uh, we'll have 60 seconds for each question uh, that I pose to you about the race. Um, and again, we'll be, we will be uh, rotating the order of questioning. At the end of each round of questionings, each of you have two rebuttal cards, and you can use them if you would like to make uh, a supplemental statement about that question or if you would like to perhaps raise an issue about that question that hasn't been raised earlier uh, or to respond to something. Those, thir those rebuttal cards give you 30 more seconds, and I will recognize them in the order that you raise them, and we will start those rebuttal cards after we have completed the entire, the entire round. Again, you'll have two for those, so uh, use them wisely. Uh, and at the end, we're going to have summations, and uh, 
the rule there is we'll, we'll either go one or two minutes depending on what, how we're looking on time. Uh, we do ask that, uh, that you adhere to the time limits. Uh, I've explained to you how the red, the, uh, red yellow, and green system work. Uh, you would get a yellow warning when your time is about up. And then if you get the red light, and some of you will, I know, I've listened to you. Uh, what I'd like for you to do is just end your sentence. You know, not you. Won't, if you need to, to go further, you would have the opportunity to use the rebuttal card at some point. But but you know, you can't go on uh, like to complete your thought because the thought might last a lot longer than we than we really need. So sort of the sentence that you're on is where I ask you to stop. Uh, with that, I'll just ask you if you have any questions before we get started. And uh, but but we but without any questions, what we'll start with the opening statement. Now, on the in the opening statement, please give me a. Uh, you have two minutes. You can say pretty much what you want, but I would like a brief summary of your personal background. Uh, maybe some of what you, you where you live, uh, what you do for a living, uh, and maybe give me your assessment of what you think people expect from a school board member. Reverend Joel Churchwell, I'll let you start. Thank you, Elliot. Uh, good afternoon to the listening audience and those who are present here on today, and certainly to the Jacksonville Alonzo Chamber of Commerce and to the Government Affairs Committee. It is truly a pleasure to be here on today, and to all the citizens of Onslow County. Uh, as we continue to uh, work our way in the aftermath of this hurricane, I still and continue to pray for our recovery. Uh, as I sit uh, here and yet again, uh, present myself as a candidate for the Onslow County Board of Education. It has truly been a pleasure for me to serve over the past four years. Uh, with that said, um, I have an understanding of what uh, classroom teachers experience because my wife has spent time in the classroom, so I completely understand the additional requirements and additional resources that are sometimes required by our teachers uh, as they are preparing for lesson plans and producing a, a wonderful vibrant uh, learning environment. I am uh, a retired Marine. I pastor a local church here in Jacksonville, uh, Sandy Run Missionary Baptist Church. Um, in conjunction with uh, the Marine Corps experience and uh, the experiences that I've gained as a pastor, I've been actively involved in our community for the past 13 years, uh, volunteering on various boards, uh, the formerly Department of Social Services, a board of directors, child fatality protection team, consolidated human services, juvenile crime prevention council. So with all those experiences and many more, uh, I feel like I am qualified uh, because I have a rich uh, perspective, had the opportunity to engage in many of those board meetings to hear the dialogue and the common values that uh, accentuate our great community. So with that, uh, Mr. Elliott, that concludes my opening statement. Our next candidate is Jeff Hudson. Thank you, Elliot. My name is Jeff Hudson, running for Board of Education. Uh, I'm a lifelong resident of Onslow County, and so is my wife. We're raising our family here. I've perhaps got the most important job. I'm a dad, and my son is currently in high school. And so education is incredibly important to me. Without the benefits of education and my start here in Onslow County, there's no way I could have had my career. Uh, I, I did not grow up in a wealthy household, and it was only through education that I was able to advance. And so I dedicated my professional life to public service here in my home county. I began as a town manager in Holly Ridge, then went to work as a deputy county manager, assistant county manager, and then I went to the Board of Education, Onslow County School System, and I, I did what Steve Myers does now. Uh, a little bit different back then, but basically assistant superintendent for auxiliary services. So a lot of the things that, that weren't specifically in the classroom, we said that we provided the stage from which instruction performs. With that knowledge behind me, I then went to the county and was county manager. Now I'll say, uh, of everything I can say today, let me tell you, Elliot, something you mentioned earlier. Um, right now I'm serving as CEO of a, a water utility on WASA. And my mind for the last few weeks has not been on politics. And, and I know many people's mind is not on politics. It's on recovery. I'm here today because I believe that this is very important. And also because I believe that at this time, our school system faces a tremendous challenge with recovery. 
And this is an opportunity to be a platform for those teachers, for those educators that are right now out there, still not in their schools, still seeing pictures on the internet and television of, of schools that are, are flooded uh, with, with all kinds of things going through them uh, and the recovery process ongoing. So I'm hoping that if there's nothing else that happens today, we can all become better advocates for a school system in trouble. Thank you. And our next candidate is Bill Lanier. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Bill Lanier. Of course, I'm running for uh, Onslow County Board of Education. I've uh, been living in Onslow County since 1982. I'm a homeowner and a retired Marine widower. Uh, recently lost my wife about three years now. Time goes by so fast. Um, I have worked in behavioral health care and also worked in Onslow County school systems in the uh, special needs uh, section. Uh, I've worked uh, from high school on down to preschool. Uh, it's given me a good perspective on what goes on inside the classroom, um, what challenges there are for uh, parents and students alike. And it, it gives me a means of understanding how to communicate better, uh, which is not always an ideal situation. Um, as far as I'm concerned, it's important that we establish in our school system because a lot of things are common. The economics are common. The expansion of schools are common. Those things are going to occur and they have to be addressed, but it takes communication and cooperation. Um, what I'm about as well as that is curriculum control, of course, fiscal responsibility, communicating with all stakeholders and community involvement as much as possible and partnering. That's very vital. And also understanding and, and, and going as far as to look into what makes other types of educational systems work so that our education system can be more diverse and more responsive to the needs of the community. I thank you for, for hearing us today and, and hope for your support. Thank you. Uh, Bob Williams. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity for the chamber and for the sponsors of the IST to come before you today and talk with you. Just briefly, my wife and I moved to Onslow County in 2009 to be closer to, at that time, four grandchildren. We've increased that by three, so we've got seven grandchildren in the local area. I'm very concerned about the uh, current conditions with the uh, uh, recent flood and the uh, storm conditions with Hurricane Florence. Uh, as an active member of the Board of Education, I have been receiving some reports that are disturbing, and it's going to take us a long time to recover. We've got some serious issues looking ahead. I'm not a professional educator, but I'm empathetic with the educators in the process that they have to go through. I'm a Republican. I'm a conservative Republican. Conservative Republicans believe in smaller government and localized government, and I'm very much in favor of that. My background is that uh, I did 20 years with the Air Force, 10 years with uh, various airlines, and then I did 10 years with the Los Angeles Unified School District and worked my way up to the uh, position of Deputy Inspector General. Primarily, I'm a fraud and a criminal investigator. That's been my background since I've been here. Uh, I've dabbled in photography and had a small business. My wife, uh, Alice, uh, and I have been married for 48 years, have two children. We have eight grandchildren. We're very much in tune with the needs of the community. Although we evacuated out of the area and uh, had to stay out for 10 days before we could get our way back in here, we kept tabs on what was going on the entire time frame. As I mentioned earlier, I'm not an educator. I'm a business person. Our going forward and our road to recovery is going to depend on making sure that we have adequate resources and the financial resources, et cetera, to make sure that we can do that. And I'll work with the other board members to make sure we can get those done. Thank you. Uh, Marcy Walford. Yes. yes, thank you for having us today. Thank you, Chamber and sponsors, for allowing us to be here. My heart is with the citizens of Onslow County. It's, it's painful to see images of our schools the way they are right now, but what has been beautiful is to see the community come together the way that they have and helping each other, and that's, that's a blessing to us all. And I, we have lived in Onslow County for 11 years, and I am running for Board of Education because the students of Onslow County are my priority. 
I have two children in the school system. My youngest has an IEP. He started at Thompson Early Childhood Center when he was three years old. And that has a special place in my heart, Thompson. And the school staff, where he is now in the elementary school, they see him grow. We are all amazed to see the progress that he's made. So I want to make sure that every child in Onslow County has the chance to have a quality education. And I remain grateful to the educators that have devoted their time to our children and helped them grow. And I want to support them. And I want to continue to move Onzo County Schools forward. So. Thank you. Um, Mr. Hudson, we'll, we'll ask you to start this line of questioning. We'll work our way back to uh, Reverend Churchwell. Uh, I asked this, I'm going to try to get as many of the uh, audience questions in as I can because I had asked a version of this question. My version was something like your impression of the overall quality of education that Onzo County provides. The, the person, the audience, uh, did a little more research and, it's school, and says that school's performance is a very important factor in economic development as it relates to workforce as well as overall attractiveness and quality of life of any community. In Onzo County, 70.6% of schools are graded at C or below, nine are graded B, and there are no A schools according to the state's grading system. Uh, in addition to seeking additional funding, what other ways would you propose to improve Onzo County Public Schools' performance and ultimately the community's economic competitiveness? Thank you. First of all, I would agree that public education is key to economic development. Uh, having worked on our local economic development council for a while, I can tell you that when we tried to woo companies to come into Onslow County, the executives of those companies always looked at the school system. They all have families, or many of them did, and they want to make sure that their own families are going to be moving to a community that, that provides them the necessary resources. So that question is directly on point. It's, it's right on the money there. Uh, I believe that the success and failure of any school system starts with the classroom. And inside the classroom, the single point of success or failure is the teacher. And so I, I do believe that there is a, a minimum amount of money that's necessary. There is certainly a minimum amount of supplies um, and, and things that we need to do for those teachers. But we need to ensure that they have time for professional development. We need to make sure that they have the resources and specifically their supervisors inside the school system, the principals and the assistant principals, have to be selected very, very carefully because uh, leadership starts at the top. Okay, uh, Mr. Lanier. My basic concern in that area is the fact that the requirement for any education system is to provide a basic education for all the students that enter the doors and exit at the end of a 12-year period. Um, the basics is basically they relate to the technology and the times. It's important to actually fund resources where they're best used. Um, say, for instance, computers. Very important in this day and age, but not necessarily important for preschoolers. Resources have to be needed out in the exact areas where they are, and foundational training needs to be established in those areas where they actually take hold because it is those basics that travel with the students from that point all the way through the 12th grade. And at that point, they use those basics to add to their repertoire on establishing a life. That's one of the most fundamental things concerning education. If, if it's done that way consistently, costs can be held down considerably while also ensuring that each student achieves their goals. Mr. Williams? I don't believe there's a direct correlation to the amount of money that we spend uh, per student or per school. I believe it goes back to the basics. I believe that uh, society, number one, we have a very transient society here in Jacksonville and Onzo County. We have a lot of military students that come through. We have a lot of our teachers that are transient as well. They're connected to the military and they come through the process as well. There is an essential amount of money that is needed, and, and we need to pay our teachers well. We need to be able to hire qualified teachers, but we need to engage families. The families in the school process, it's a, it's a process that starts at the family in the home 
before they ever enter the schoolhouse. And it's important that we work with the communities in order to get them to that level and then work with the teachers there. The teachers and the families and all of the people involved need to be in part of this process. Thank you. Ms. Wofford? Thank you. So when we have these school levels, we know that certain schools are maybe economically disadvantaged and they're all kind of automatically at a disadvantage from the get-go and we need to make sure we're taking care of those issues so we can help bring these students up to par where we can. We have two issues here. We, Since people are wanting to move to Onslow County, we have student growth. Then we need more funding to build more schools. So this just goes back to where one of my main stances is that we need to fully fund our schools and make sure that we're having, including mon money for growth and building new schools and to uh, have places for all of our students. Thank you. And Rev okay, thanks. Reverend Churchwell? Certainly, uh, funding is an issue. Uh, we realize that uh, parent involvement is an issue. But also, I think that we can continue to move forward in the various platforms that are existent within uh, the learning and teaching environment, whether it be a digital platform, uh, we know technology is uh, ever-present in, in our school systems and in our classrooms, and uh, most of our students, uh, I don't think they can remember a time that uh, they didn't have a personal computer device in their hand. So we have to look at all those technologies and the use of those technologies to, to collect data, uh, that the teacher may be able to uh, find that data as a resource to help them craft and, and be able to prepare our students uh, to be more competitive in a global uh, environment as well as a local environment, exposing them to those uh, 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 learning skills and those technologies that will allow them to continue to be competitive. Uh, All right, thank you. Uh, another another question that's been asked and was on my list as well is uh, now that the county has ended its agreement for a funding formula uh, for the school system. Um, how can the Board of Education approach the county to ensure its financial needs are met? And this, and the other question from the audience, similar, is uh, what criteria will you use as a guide to negotiate a new funding formula with the county commissioners? Mr. Lanier, we'll start with you. As, as far as funding goes and all of the various entities that actually um, get their funding through the county, uh, they have to be more responsible and accountable as to what's available to them. Of course, we have school buildings and other resources that have to be met. But at that level, the county is definitely responsible for needing out money to various different um, governmental entities. Um, I say it's right at the feet of the um, superintendent and the uh, administrators of the school system to determine where they're going to place their funds and how effectively they're going to use them. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Williams. Thank you. Uh, Hurricane Florence has uh, impacted more than uh, just the, uh, the local area here. Uh, the school board had a special board meeting uh, scheduled that we were going to discuss uh, the funding formula and then we were going to sit down with the county commissioners in a joint meeting and all of that's been put on hold at this time so it is something to the school district and the school board in particular is looking at and working with staff to do that one of my concerns uh, with a funding formula is that if one agency can unilaterally decide that the funding formula is not going to be used then it's a useless formula to start with. The state has mandated a formula that if the school districts and county commissioners cannot get along or cannot come to an agreement that they have to resort back to that. So it's something that the Board of Education and the county commissioners need to set down. We need to have a very frank discussion and be able to work out what will work best for the county. It's all county funds. There's no separate funding formula for county and the school district. Thank you. Swafford? Yes, and I, I agree with Mr. Williams that we need to have an agreement together with the county so that we know the schools are funded. We, we know we have these 
requirements from the state that are mandated, things such as classroom sizes. And I just, I don't think it's fair to be wondering, are the schools going to be funded? When are we voting on this? We need to have it firmed up and we need to make sure that we have all of this laid out and we can move forward together. As far as the requirements, you know, we need to make sure we have these classroom sizes and building buildings ready to be built and that are for our incoming students. Reverend Churchwell. I've had an opportunity as well as some of the other board members to visit some of our schools. And, and within those uh, opportunities to visit our schools, uh, oftentimes it was to showcase uh, their leader in me. And, and habit number five of leader in me says, uh, seek first to understand, then to be understood. So I think with both boards, it gives us an opportunity to model uh, to our students uh, that two entities uh, that are governing one community uh, can come together, discuss, uh, find a solution, and, and continue to move forward to where uh, education is funded at the appropriate levels. Uh, the school board has some insight on what it uh, will be expecting uh, for the funding to help uh, continue to move our schools forward. Okay, and uh, Mr. Hudson. Thank you. First of all, I would say that in North Carolina, funding for education is also a responsibility of the county, just like funding for public safety or the court system. So it's something that has to be carefully considered. When, whenever we were working on the joint education funding formula uh, years ago, there was open dialogue between both parties. It's hard to move forward if you don't have open dialogue and if one party or another acts without notice or unexpectedly. So first of all, I think you have to have good communication at the highest levels. I did note that the county waited until the state of North Carolina took lawsuits or litigation off the table before that funding formula was eliminated. Now it goes to mediation. So if the county and the school system cannot agree, then the next thing that happens, it goes to a state funding formula, which I believe the public and the county would find is somewhat similar in nature to the county funding formula. I got to keep on going. <laughs> so, so what happens then? Well, what happens then is you use an objective measure for, for some objectivity in funding schools, what is best, what is right. The public of Onslow County selects the Onslow County Board of Education to look over the budget and adopt a budget, not the superintendent's office. The buck stops with the people you elect for Board of Education. And that Board of Education have to make sure that every dollar is spent responsibly for the right things based on sound decision making. It's the county's responsibility to fund and an objective funding formula which we had in place was a good way to do that. Any other extended remarks or rebuttals on that, on that question, which I know is an important one. Um, Another question that's come up, well, in the last few weeks, uh, and I will start with you, Mr. Williams. Uh, people were kind of surprised that schools were not built to certain standards uh, to meet, the, for example, a Category 3 hurricane or more or greater. Uh, would you suggest that in the future, and I'm asking all of you this question, uh, that schools be built to those kind of shelter standards? Building codes uh, change uh, year to year and over uh, decades, et cetera. So the codes that uh, the majority of our buildings uh, were built to were built to code to, to a CAT 2. The buildings that we're currently building, I don't know what the code is. Uh, nobody comes and tells us what uh, standard that uh, they're building to. I was as uh, surprised to find out that we could only uh, shelter up to a CAT 2 as well uh, during this process. So, yes, I do believe that we should build them as strongly as possible, but you have to understand that uh, I don't know what that is. And I'm not sure that anyone here in the county knows what that is. When you're talking about a big building like that, we're talking about a, a considerable amount of money that would have to be expended to make it shelters. Uh, there's other facilities in the county that we might also uh, explore to make shelters out as well. Ms. Wofford? Yes, that was surprising to all of us to find that out. And I, I do believe we should make them able to withstand Category 4 or storms because we're 
we, we're in the path. I think we might keep getting them because of where we are. Mr. Williams does have a good idea to use other buildings in the county as well, but currently our schools are our shelters. They're sheltering our residents right now, I guess they still are. And uh, so it's very important. And then we would also have less damage and maybe be able to get back to school faster if our schools were increased to a higher code. Okay, uh, Reverend Churchwell. Have it number five. Seek first to understand, then to be understood. I think we all understand after this hurricane that we probably need to look at uh, if our uh, schools are going to be designated as shelters, uh, what that cost is going to look like, um, and how do we move forward. And I think um, uh, those parties that are going to be involved in that decision uh, probably understand that. I know I do. Uh, from the number of phone calls that I have received. So I definitely will be exploring that, whether I'm on the board or as a citizen of Onslow County. Okay, Mr. Hudson. Thank you. I've sat on both sides of the fence. As uh, assistant superintendent, I was responsible for school facilities that became shelters. We made improvements there with radio communications. Uh, we actually asked for assistance at one time from FEMA to pre-wire our schools or portions of them for generator backup so we didn't have to pull 6,500 kW generators out to run a few light bulbs. Uh, unfortunately, it's always about money and whether or not uh, that is possible because just after we had done that, uh, Katrina came through. And we learned a lot of lessons in Katrina. On the county management side, where I, what I set for eight, seven, eight years, we learned that there are some storms that you don't need to stay here for. And if it looks like it's a strong Cat 4 or a Cat 5, then no community infrastructure is going to be able to support you if you're still in a shelter. Now, let me caveat that by saying there should always be perhaps some shelter of last resort for those people that, that simply don't leave and should have, and those we should harden, if not the whole school, then a portion of the school. Okay, thank you. And Mr. Lanier. And on that note, I tend to uh, agree with uh, Mr. Hudson here. Uh, I had jotted down a note here to basically uh, identify and, and currently concurrently build schools that, that can withstand storms of a uh, higher um, destructive grade, but to identify specific schools that are uh, to be shelters because it's not economically feasible to uh, go back and start remodeling schools to withstand storms. It's like Mr. Hudson says, there are just certain storms where it's not safe to be in this area at all. Okay. Uh, Ms. Walford, you're going to get first crack at this one, and, um, and then we're going to reverse order and go down this way, and then we'll reverse order again and get, uh, give Reverend Churchwell a chance to start things for a change. He's been at the, been at the back of the pack for a little bit. Um, there was a decision made last May, and, and there's a couple of questions on this as well. There was a decision made last May uh, to close class or to cancel classes so that students could, I mean, excuse me again, teachers could attend a rally in Raleigh on behalf of school funding and teacher pay. Um, first off, I'd like to, well, I'd just like to get your view on how that situation was handled. There, there was a speaker that raised questions about that at a recent board meeting, and there were some questions raised at the time as to whether or not uh, that is an appropriate thing to do. Okay. Well, first of all, I support our teachers. They show up for our students every day, and I think that we should show up for them. Teaching is more than a job. Teachers change children's lives. So uh, it's not just about pay. I know that teachers are trying to improve their students' education system. So as far as the decision the board made I trust the board members to make the decision. They create the policies. They voted on closing the schools that day. It becomes a public safety matter if we don't have enough teachers in classrooms. It's, they make a decision similar to if we have a weather day and uh, decide to close the schools. So I support the decision of the board in May. Thank you, Mr. Williams. My position on this has been fairly well known and I've spoke to it uh, often. I don't believe that it was handled properly. 
I've informed uh, the board members and I've informed the superintendent at the time that I didn't think it should happen that way. We could have done both. We could have had a system that some of the teachers from each of the schools that wanted to attend could have represented Onslow County Schools at the march, and it would have worked out very well and we could have stayed open. It's all dependent on the number of substitutes that you have, and that's basically, and that was waived. The school board did not make that decision. The school board supported, or, or members of the school board supported the decision that the superintendent made. That was the superintendent's call. I told him at the time that I didn't agree with it. I would tell him again today that I didn't agree with the process. It was uh, not handled, in my opinion, in the proper format. I think uh, going forward, we need to review that. Uh, there was no vote. It was a telephone poll uh, that was done of the board members. Okay, thank you. And uh, Mr. Lanier? Uh, having been in the military for quite some time, 20 years, people entering certain professions should understand that pay scales are there for a specific purpose as a gradient factor. When you're dealing with um, government entities, with um, bodies of people, large numbers, it's unsustainable to just give in to whatever anyone's demanding in the moment. Uh, when people are on the taxpayer's uh, dollar and there's a pay gradient, it is wholly responsible for them to be where they should be at all times when required to be there. Um, it would have been simpler for them to have chosen certain representatives to go and represent them at uh, Raleigh uh, to cover the specific issue. It had been done in the past and it would have made sense to do it. Um, my opinion that is that um, that particular issue was being driven from outside forces. Uh, teachers are great. They're wonderful. I work with them. They're, they're just like anyone here and just like myself, and we all have to do. Thank you. Um, Mr. Hudson? Thank you. First of all, I would say that uh, I mentioned this earlier. Teachers are the single point of success or failure in a classroom, and we have to support our, our teachers and instructional personnel. Um, I believe that just because you become a government employee or become a teacher, you don't give up your right to have a voice. This is a democracy, after all, and I think it's important that we be able to go to our capital and, and express ourselves. At the same time, however, I believe there was another way that it could have been handled. It was employed by other districts. I think if we had had a, an ability to have a delegation from every school, a large delegation, therefore, from the county, and why not Board of Education members also going? This isn't just about uh, teachers having to hold up the banner for teachers. This should be once again, from, from the Board of Education down, let's, let's see who could have gone and represented issues fairly. As it was, it ended up being a, an imposition on schools. Not every, not every person that works for the school system got paid when schools shut down. And that was an unintended consequence, perhaps. In addition, an unintended consequence was the parents that had to immediately get daycare for that day. Okay, thank you. And uh, Reverend Churchwell. I believe transparency is openly and frequently sharing your successes and sharing your failures and sharing your dilemmas. Uh, I was one of the ones who supported uh, the teachers. I support teachers. Um, there was no outside influence on, on my um, agreeing with uh, the decision that had been made. Uh, were there some consequences uh, that derived from that decision? Uh, yes, there were. Uh, I, I take responsibility for those. Uh, should the decision have to come up again? Uh, an elderly person told me hindsight is 2020. Uh, so now that I know a little bit more, I understand a little bit more, uh, I, I realize there's a, probably a better way to have satisfied the requirement of our local teachers. But uh, the bottom line is I support them. Okay. Uh Again, I invite you uh, and urge you, if you'd like to extend your remarks or to make another uh, observation, you can use your rebuttal cards. This time we're going to start with Reverend Churchwell, and we're going to go to you, Ms. Walford, and then go back down the way. So we'll see how that works. Um, I have this question in, several, in about three different forms, uh, but basically it amounts to this. Should parents be notified when there is to be a classroom discussion about sexual orientation, uh, gender identification, or sexual education in general? Yes, I, I believe that, and we 
we have a policy on the books, uh, policy 3540, where it allows uh, parental opportunities to review materials and withhold consent for student participation. So I, I don't have a problem, and I, I think uh, if we're not adhering to that, then we should be. But as far as I uh, understand that we are. So there is a policy on the books that affords our, our parents to be informed of what curriculum is being uh, taught as it relates to comprehensive uh, health education programs. Okay, and I will switch uh, to you, Ms. Wofford, and ask you if the question again is, um, should parents be notified when there is to be a classroom discussion about sexual orientation, gender identification, and then I'll just add uh, just sex education in general. Someone wanted to know about permission for sex education. Okay. Uh, but what's your thoughts on that issue? Okay. I, I was referring to the same policy that Reverend Churchwell referenced, policy 3540, that does have parents opt in when they are having sex education. I did that this year, my daughter. I signed the waiver, whether she could or could not participate. So that is current board policy, and it's also state policy. So that's currently how it is in Onzo County. Mr. Williams. I think the way the policy is currently stated, I think it's an opt-out policy. I think that uh, if, uh, if you're going to uh, have your children attend that, uh, you have to opt out if you don't want them to attend it, as well as there's several other policies we have the same, uh, same type of policy. In my opinion, parents should have the option of opting in on several of the controversial uh, issues that we have to deal with in school, sex education, comprehensive uh, uh, health education, uh, whatever we want to call it today. Uh, is a parental thing. It should be handled by the parents. The schools supplement that. Not all parents are equipped to handle it. We should have uh, capable and professional people in the school district that can teach those classes. As uh, Reverend Churchwell said, uh, it is available to the parents to look at the curricula uh, at each of the media centers in each of the schools where it's offered in order to get that. But I think it should be an opt-in as opposed to opt-out. Okay, Mr. Lanier. Short story, it should be an opt-in. Parents should be able to review all the material available, the policies, and then determine whether their child is going to participate in it because it is wholly the responsibility of parents and families to determine how their children are sexually oriented. And Mr. Hudson? I have a set of conservative values. I believe that parents should have complete control over that aspect of their child's education. That's it. Okay, uh, thanks, and we will go to, I believe, Mr. Williams with this one, and we'll come back around if I don't get dizzy and uh, while we're doing this. Okay, um, how can the school system ensure the right balance between meeting the needs of college-bound students and providing education and providing instruction for those students who are more focused on a trade? We're actually addressing that program or that problem right now, and we're building a skill center that's going to serve multi-counties plus Camp Lejeune, and that will be open next January for services, and that's going to provide for trades training. We currently already do that. There should be a balance. Not everybody is cut out to go to college. Not everybody's cut out to be a trade, you know. You kind of have to take it to and each individual student and work with those students. That's where guidance counselors come in very handy in the school systems. You have to be able to work with the students, understand the students, and individualize with the students and the parents and the teachers and work out. But it has to be the uh, it has to be a uh, integrated process. You can't just automatically think, you know, for many, many years, the school district said you got to get a college education in order to succeed. Well, we've proven that's not to be true. Okay. Mr. Lanier? I think the vocational skills center is an excellent idea. I graduated from a vocational technical high school in Massachusetts. And uh, one of the key issues concerning myself was that I wasn't guided well enough by my counselors. When I reached the end of my tenure in school, 
Um, and I was real eager to go. And I looked at the counselor and I said, well, what next? And she looked at me and she said, you can't go to college. Your grade don't reflect. And she did not reflect back on the fact that I had just did approximately three years of vocational training, nor did they give me the opportunity to step out in the community to hone those skills. So it's an effort where the school system has to partner with community entities to make sure that those kids that are going down that vocational road get that real world experience while they're in school under the tutelage of people who have actually been working in the field at the time. Thank you, Mr. Hudson. Well, I had an opportunity to, uh, to go to college and to graduate school. My dad had an opportunity to graduate from the sixth grade. Uh, he was born, Billy Hudson, born about 1911, and he had a great career in the trades and agriculture. And I'll tell you, I value both equally. And I believe that we have to continue our relationship and partnership with Coastal Carolina Community College we have to prepare these young people as, as they go forward into the trades. My Lord, has anyone hired a plumber lately? Uh, you know, it's, it's wonderful, uh, the skill set that they can bring. I had a, a great fortune of working at the school system with Onslow County Maintenance, who did whatever it took to get things back in, in place. Right now, I work at Onwasa with people that can do amazing things with electricity and pumps and motors, and, and it's just tremendous. We have to continue our focus on career and technical education, and we have to continue with the Skill Center and making sure that kids have an opportunity to do what fits them with their particular unique abilities. Reverend Churchwell? Every time I take my automobile in to get it serviced, I wonder. Uh, maybe I should have taken auto mechanics when I was in high school. Uh, I, I think, as all of our panelists have already indicated, that I think that should be a balance. I know when I was in high school, as Mr. Lanier indicated, uh, we were, it was considered vocational tech. And I took up printing. But because I had that printing class, uh, that was the highlight of my day to attend that printing class. But in attending that printing class, Mr. Beecham, who was our printing teacher, emphasized the importance of all the other subjects that I was participating in and going to class, uh, uh, as well as uh, sitting in class taking. So uh, that may be the highlight of a student's day, and you can use that as a motivating factor to get them to participate and use it as a behavior change to get them to be a more positive student in the classroom. So, yes, I think there needs to be a balance. Right. Ms. Wofford? Thank you. Yes, I, I believe we should have both tracks or several tracks. There's a college track. There's a vocational track. Uh, all of our students should be well-rounded. I'm very excited. My daughter is in a class that is teaching her cooking, kind of reminds me more of home ec, and I'm, I'm grateful for that because uh, it's not really fun in the kitchen trying to teach her sometimes. But I'm really grateful that we're well-rounding the children, and each children have, they have different capabilities and skill sets, and I'm glad we're, yeah. And I believe you started this one, did you not? I did. And uh, Mr. Lee, do you have a yeah. rebuttal? I, I just wanted to add that uh, even though I was told that uh, I couldn't go to college and my grades didn't reflect, um, the basics that I had gotten through that education for those 12 years proved my counselor wrong. Basics are important. There has, um, I'm going to start this question with uh, with you, Mr. Lanier, and we'll work our way down to the right and back to the left. Um, there has been a lot of talk about uh, lately about hardening our schools to make them safer, especially in light of the uh, shooting down in Florida. There was, of course, this was a top topic hit then that was much discussed. What are your thoughts about what can and should be done to make our schools safer? Um, right now, Onslow County has is, is got it pretty much going on concerning uh, school safety and their partnerships with uh, local law enforcement. Uh, there are, as we had discussed during the last forum, ways of um, hardening schools at lesser expense, you know, ballistics, curtains, things like that. Uh, also, um, hiring on qualified security uh, in those areas that are at higher risk or propensity for violence to occur. Um, it's up to community to determine uh, precisely where those areas are and what schools need to be hardened most. Mr. Williams? Hardening schools is a difficult process when you have a large school district such as Onzo County. 
We have uh, a lot of facilities out there that are not part of the main campus. We have portable learning uh, trailers, uh, learning centers, if you will, that are more difficult to harden. It's, and as the people talked this morning uh, with the legislators uh, when they uh, did their uh, summation of this question, each school district has to look at themselves and determine what we can do. Onzo County has been in that process for the four years that I've been on the school board. We've uh, upgraded uh, security measures. I'm not going to discuss the measures that we've uh, upgraded, but we have done a number of things to make the schools hardened. Uh, we've also uh, have uh, qualified law enforcement, and I think that we can always do more. Ms. Walford? Yes, I think school safety is definitely of the utmost importance to me. And we can continue with these efforts to harden our schools, efforts like with our highly trained officers there and, you know, talking with community law enforcement and security experts, maybe at the Marine Corps base bases and uh, continue to make it as safe as possible in the schools. And I think another thing that Onzo County Schools is doing that is extremely important is partnering with Trillium for some mental health efforts for the students. And we could continue to look into situations, uh, partnerships like that for our students and their families and community members to just make our whole community safer overall and, and healthier. Thank you. Member Churchwell. As Mr. Williams uh, indicated, the, over the past four years that I've been on the Board of Education, that has been an ongoing conversation on how we are to harden our campuses. And given the fact that some of our campuses are uh, built up under the design that they're more open than others, uh, realizing that as we go forward that we're going to have to look at those design features. But yes, I believe that we have to continue to look at security, uh, find those measures that are best appropriate. Uh, within the various campuses, uh, understanding that, you know, security is, is, is a priority now. Um. Mr. Hudson? Well, I believe that uh, we certainly have learned due to past tragedies across the nation how important security is at our campuses. I had made a comment about some things that we could possibly do, and some of it would cost some money. And the person I was with said, well, you know, for that much money, we could also do this, this, and this. And I said, well, after the first incident that happens, you will wish that you had spent that small amount of money on these things. There are some things that are, that are undoubtedly being worked on right now that, that those of us uh, in the public aren't aware of, and I commend the Board of Education and staff for working on those items. It is inappropriate to say what those specifically are here. And Bob, I appreciate you, you refraining from doing so. I believe generally we can say that there are practices that help guard our students that must be followed universally and without exception. And I believe that in addition to, to something structural or environmental, we can make sure that we have the right practices in place at all of our schools. Okay. Well, uh, we have come to the end of the questions. Uh, said we'd try to get this in in less than an hour. Um, and I appreciate you folks following the time limits. I'm going to start with uh, you, Ms. Wofford, for the closing statement, if that's okay, and we'll move right down the way uh, since we moved the other way for the, uh, for the opening statement and give you an opportunity, a minute for close. Okay. Thank you. Well, I'm glad to be here today and talk some about our schools, and I hope that you will vote for me. I believe I am, one, I am the right candidate for the schools. I want to be a voice for our students our parents. I want to support our educators and continue moving Onslow County forward. That's really. Thank you. Mr. Williams. Thank you. Again, I appreciate the fact that uh, we have this opportunity to speak to the public, and I know that these will uh, be shown as we go uh, through the next uh, few weeks into the election cycle. One of the first things I think I'd like to uh, say in summation is that uh, no matter who you vote for, it's important that you go out and vote. It's also very important that you get up to speed on who your candidates are. You've just uh, seen a very short synopsis of each one of us as we've gone through this process. I have a website called electbobwilliams.org. 
I would encourage people that are considering uh, Board of Education members to go to my website, take a look at it. I can get you more information off that, plus there's contact information on there that you can reach out and you can talk with me directly. It's very important that you understand who your, con who your uh, representatives are going to be on the school board. It's also equally important that you and your neighbors and your family and friends get out and vote. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Lanier. Uh, thank you all for, for having us here today. It's been a pleasure to present ourselves, and, um, and I'm sure I'm speaking for everyone, but particularly myself. Uh, entering the, the race has given me the opportunity to uh, actually learn to add more on to what I have to offer. I do believe in curriculum control, fiscal responsibility, and professional viability. This touches on the basis of uh, teacher pay and all the other issues that are very, very important to keeping quality people working in our school system. But cooperation, communication, and stakeholder involvement are just as important as well. Um, like Bob said, it's imperative that you learn about the candidates, learn what our platforms are, learn what best suits everyone in the community and not just particularly yourselves. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Hudson. Thank you. I appreciate your consideration for Board of Education. You can learn more about me at my website, electjeffhudson.com. I would like to use the rest of my time to be an advocate for our school system and teachers that are facing a tremendous recovery effort right now. To the Board of Education, to our principals, uh, we're effectively restarting school. You're in school nine days and we've been out for 10. I'd like to encourage principals to please communicate with staff if you've not done so already. Is that particular teacher's room inhabitable, or is it completely destroyed? I remember after Fran, uh, people going to the island wanted to know, is my house still there? And uh, that was when I was with emergency management and with the county, uh, as county, county deputy county manager, and people wanted to know. We need a teacher work day. Especially elementary schools need to be able to set up their classroom again. How will we handle the instructional framework, formerly pacing guidelines? Teachers need to know that we can support them in this pacing of instruction that now has to happen with basically a whole new school year. If we take all the professional development days away, how will we continue to support teachers? Thank you for supporting educators. Thank you. Thank you, and Reverend Churchwell. Certainly it has been a pleasure to serve on the past four years on the Onslow County Board of Education, and I certainly look forward to serving again. Uh, I can be reached at joelchurchwell at yahoo.com. Again, I just want to continue to uh, emphasize the importance of stakeholder communication, uh, teacher retention, making sure we provide our teachers with the excellent platforms that they need to be productive in the classroom and continue to foster parent involvement. I believe that the more the community gets involved in the school, uh, the better our educational and school environment will be, the better our economy will be as a whole. So again, I continue to strive for those initiatives and continue to be visible and continue to visit schools and continue to support those initiatives that are going to help Onslow County become what I believe all the citizens wants it to be, a great county. All right. And uh, with that, uh, we conclude the program. I want to, again, thank the candidates. And I think it's time to give them an applause uh, for <laughs> We have about four times more questions than I could had time to ask here, Lorette, but I'm going to turn it over to Lorette Ligon, the president of the Jacksonville Onzo Chamber of Commerce. Thank you, Elliot, and thank you for being our moderator today, and best of luck to all of you in the upcoming elections. Cindy, thank you for your help, chamber staff, and especially Janet Bowen, who is in charge of these events. Um, I also want to thank our corporate sponsor, Duke Energy, and the citizen of Jacksonville for the use of these facilities and, of course, their media services. Now, those watching, if you missed any part of the forum, check the listings for G10 for the rebroadcast dates and times. And everyone remember, your vote does count. The absentee ballot forms are now available on the Onslow County Board of Elections website, as well as the dates, times, and locations for the early one-stop voting. Election day is November the 6th from 6.30 a.m. to 7.30 p.m. at your local precinct. On behalf of the Jacksonville Onslow Chamber of Commerce, thank you for joining us for our Meet the Candidates Forum, and this concludes our program.